Grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. We're focusing on the third article of the Apostles' Creed that we believe in the Holy Christian Church. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for gathering us here to hear your word. It's not an accident that we came here today. And so I pray, Lord God, that you would do your work. That you would do your work through me, but don't let me get in the way of your word. Pray that you would also speak to our young people, especially our confirmants, that they'd be encouraged to follow you no matter what. And I pray that you would get all of the glory. In your name we pray, amen. Have you heard about this headline? Starbucks rolls out a delivery service for coffee drinkers. Do you hear about this? Not only can you call up Domino's and have a pizza delivered to your front door, not only can you call up Jimmy John's and have a sandwich delivered to your front door, but now the new thing they're rolling out in January this year was now you can pay overpriced coffee and pay another $4 on top of that and deliver it to your very front door. And it sounds tempting. I could see doing this, right? Because it's part of an overall trend that's going on in our society. It's something like this, that we want the product without having to deal with the people, right? We want the product without having to deal with the people. And, and this explains my whole uh, Christmas planning, right? I want to, to get my shopping done without having to deal with the people. I go right to Amazon, click right through the list, buy all the things and have them delivered to my front door so I don't have to deal with the people, And because of this trend, you know, places like Shopco are going out of business, right? Because no one wants to go to a store anymore. We just want the product without having to deal with the people. And this is affecting uh, even our own church body's publishing house. For for decades, we had a a physical store where where people could buy books, uh, but no more. Uh, Northwestern Publishing House uh, the store does not exist anymore. You can only order uh, publishing or our books through, through online sales. And so it's part of an overall trend that we want the product without having to deal with the people. And this is also kind of connected to or affecting our spiritual life as well. Um, maybe we want the product, give me Jesus, but don't make me deal with all of the people, right? And I get this. If I wasn't paid to stand here, I think I'd be tempted to stay in my pajamas and just listen to a sermon online, right? And, and listen to a podcast or listen to some music online and just get the product of my faith without having to interact with all of these people. And, and this is an overall trend. We, we heard a statistic yesterday at the seminar, and I've mentioned it before, that 8,000 people a year are leaving our church body. That if this trend goes, there will be no wells in 2065. We'll be shop co. We'll be out of business, right? Because people are walking away. Uh, they want to maybe just get Jesus, but not deal with the people. And in fact, uh, maybe not you young people, but other young people might have said something like this, right? Or I've said this, or maybe you've said this. I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the church anymore, right? I believe in Jesus. Of course I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the church. In fact, uh, yesterday we heard that statistic that 99% of people in the United States know about Jesus, could, could clarify Jesus. And many of them um, uh, say they believe in Jesus, but only 18% said that they would let their life be inconvenienced for Jesus or ever come to church on a regular basis for Jesus. That, that means once a month. Many of us are saying, I believe in Jesus, but I don't think I believe in the church anymore. Well, um, if that's true, uh, uh, here's my question. Is that true? Could that be true? Could it be true that I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe in the church? Can that be true? Well, the early Christian church didn't think so. The early Christian church didn't think you could have Jesus and not have the church. We've been going through uh, the Apostles' Creed, and the Apostles' Creed was written by early Christians in the second century, And they wrote this creed to kind of say the simple statements of faith that you said you would believe before you were baptized on Easter. And so before you were baptized on Easter, uh, during the time of Lent, they would teach you these simple statements of the faith. And you'd say things like, uh, before you were baptized on Easter, you would say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe that before you were baptized on Easter. 
And we talked about that in the first sermon. And then you would say, uh, before I was baptized on Easter, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. That I believe he's my Savior. And, and before you were baptized on Easter, you would say, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And so this is what we've been doing during Lent. We've been going through these simple truths leading up to Easter. And I think all of us would say, of course I believe in God the Father. Sign me up. I believe in Jesus Christ. He's my Savior. And I believe in the Holy Spirit. But then the early Christian church said this. If you believe in God the Father, you believe in God the Son, you believe in God the Holy Spirit, you're also going to say this. I believe in the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. The early Christians in the second century said you couldn't be a Jesus-only Christian and not also believe in the church. You couldn't just say, I want the product Jesus, but I don't want to deal with the people. The early Christians said they go together. Well, how did they get there? Why did they say, if you're a Christian, you also believe in the church? To answer this question, we're going to go to uh, what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 16. This is the most comprehensive uh, teaching by Jesus on the Christian church. And, and uh, to give you a little background, when Jesus taught this, he took his disciples on a retreat. Uh, we did this with our leadership mentoring group. We went on a retreat, and, and that's what Jesus did. He took his group, and they went way far away. Uh, I'll show you where it was. Uh, here's, a, here's a map. Uh, Jesus took them way up to Caesarea Philippi, uh, also known as the region of Dan. So Jesus was born down here in Bethlehem. He did a lot of ministry and died in Jerusalem. He was raised in Nazareth, did a lot of ministry. But when he wanted to get away with his disciples, he went up north to a cabin, right? He went away. He went away with his disciples. Uh, and, and here is a little clear picture of that. So Jesus did ministry in Nazareth. Uh, but when he wanted to get away, he went way up there. Now, not only did I think he wanted to get away with his disciples, but I think there was a strategic reason that he went to Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi, this region of Dan, had a giant rock, this big rock that many people think he was teaching on top of a rock. And right next to the rock um, was a place that was like a spring that came from Mount Hermon. And many people called that in modern day, or you can call it the highway to hell. It was the gateway to Hades because this was a place of lots of superstition. In the Old Testament, the king um, Jeroboam built a golden calf in Dan. That kind of started the superstition. And then they had all these pagan rituals that were going on um, in this place. In fact, if you were to maybe uh, produce the movie The Blair Witch Project, I mean, you've heard of that movie, right? You would go to Caesarea Philippi. This was kind of um, the, 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 the pagan place to do all those pagan things, Okay. This is where you would film the exorcist. This was um, the highway to hell, the gateway to, to Hades, they would call it. So Jesus was using this important visual to teach something about the church. So let's see what he had to teach. He took away his confirmation class, his disciples, and, and, he, and he got them away and he asked them a question. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, way up north, uh, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Right? Like, kind of like I asked you all these questions in class, and this is their examination question. Who do people say Jesus is? And the disciples said, well, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah. In other words, some say you're a great preacher, like John the Baptist. Some say you're this revolutionary leader, like Elijah. Other people think you're just a really great teacher, like Jeremiah. You know, and that's what people say today. Um, I, have a, I have a relative who says this. He's like, you know, I just believe Jesus is a good guy. He was a great teacher, but that's it, right? And, and many people say that. You know, Jesus is a good guy, uh, but he's kind of like Abraham Lincoln or Martin Luther King Jr. or Gandhi or somebody. He was a revolutionary. He had some great teaching, but that's about it. And then Jesus asked them. He said, and what about you? Who do you say I am? That's what we're asking our confirmants. What do you guys think? Who do you think Jesus is? And Simon Peter responded. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. In other words, you are what we've all been waiting for. Um, for thousands of years, literally, um, there have been hundreds of prophecies for this Messiah, which means anointed one. 
Uh, Messiah or Christ is not Jesus' last name. It means you're anointed. This is what, this is what kings were. So uh, Peter was saying, you're the great king. You're the hero we've all been waiting for for thousands of years. And not only that, you're God. You're the son of God. Some people in Rome at the same time, they put on their coins um, that Caesar was the son of God, that he was the, he was the great king, the son of God. And, and Simon Peter was saying, no, that's you, Jesus. You're God. You're the king, not Caesar. And Jesus praises him for that good answer. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. What Jesus was saying here is, Blessed are you. Um, your father Jonah, Simon, gave you the name Simon. Your, your father Jonah gave you the name Simon, but something has been revealed to you from God that I'm the Messiah. And so I'm not just going to call you Simon anymore, the name your father gave you. I'm going to call you Peter, which means Rocky. I'm going to call you a rock because of what you just said. And then Jesus goes on to explain in, in, in the most condensed way possible, most vivid way possible, the, the teaching of the church. And here's the verse. If you want to say, what verse explains the Holy Christian Church in the Bible? You go to Matthew 16, verse 18. This is the verse in the Bible that explains what the church is supposed to be. He says, I tell you that you are Rocky, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. The gates of hell will not overcome it. So this is a really dense verse of the Bible. We're going to go through it word by word. You ready? So Jesus says, you're Peter, you're Rocky, and on this rock, I'm going to build something. Now, what about, so the, now again, visualize this. They're up in Caesarea Philippi. Jesus is on this gigantic rock, a pretty powerful visual, and he says, Peter, what you just said was solid, and I'm going to build something on that. I'm going to build something on your faith. I'm going to build something on your faith. Now, the whole Bible is about builders, really. Uh, Moses built the tabernacle, which was like a tent, a, a church in the Old Testament, a, a tent, um, about 1,400 years before Jesus. Then Moses, or, I mean, uh, uh, Solomon was a builder, and he built a temple 500 years later. And now Jesus says, just like Moses built a tabernacle and Solomon built a temple, I'm going to build something. I'm a builder. I'm going to build something. I'm going to build something on the rock of your faith, Peter. What is he going to build? The church. He's going to build the church. Now, this word church is not very helpful to us because when you hear church, what are you thinking? A building, right? Uh, but a church is not a building. The word that Jesus used did not mean building. He used a very specific Greek word, ekklesia, which means an assembly, a group of people. And, so, and, and also the Jews, when they would gather together, you know what they called their church? Uh, synagogue, which means a gathering of people walk together. You know what we call our church body? A synod, which means a group of people who walk together. And so a church is not a building. In fact, the early Christians didn't meet in buildings. They met in caves and houses. They met on the side of the road. It's not a building it's a group of people. That's what the church is. It's a group of people. In fact, God made this very clear um, the way he showed up on Pentecost. You know the story of Pentecost? It's kind of a crazy story, actually. In the New Testament, 10 days after Jesus ascended into heaven, uh, all the disciples were gathered in this room. They were gathered in this room, and fire came down from heaven and started resting on them. Now, if fire started resting any one of your heads, I would be yelling, stop, drop, and roll, right? If fire came down, and that's what happened, but fire came down and rested on each of these people, and you think, wow, that's crazy. What is going on? Why, are, why is fire coming down? Well, in the Old Testament, when Moses built that tabernacle, guess what happened? Fire came down from heaven as a way of saying, that's where God is. You want to meet with God? You go to Moses' tabernacle. And then Solomon, 500 years later, he builds this temple. And guess what happened? Fire came down from heaven and rested on the temple. And God was saying, if you want to meet with God, you got to travel and come to Jerusalem and hang out at that temple. But then on Pentecost, 
fire came down from heaven again, but where did it rest? Not on a building, not on a tabernacle, but on people. And now if you want to get to know God, you've got to hang out with his people. That's the church. That's the church. The church is not a building. The church is us. We are the church. You don't go to church. You are the church. And Jesus takes this personally. He says, this is my church. This is my church. Right? Um, and he, he calls it his own possession. In fact, usually in the Bible, uh, Jesus usually talks about the church as his bride. He says that he died for the church, his bride, and he washes it clean, and he loves his church as his bride. Uh, heaven is called, says on the last day in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, last chapters of the Bible, it says that the bride of Christ, the church, comes down from heaven and dwells with his people, the bride, the church. So, Jesus calls the church his bride. Now, have you ever had relationships like this where you got along with the husband? You're friends with the husband, but you didn't get along with his wife. That ever happened, right? You might have had those kind of relationships, and you know right away that, that your friendship's probably not going to last that long. Or, at best, it's going to be superficial, right? Because it's a package deal. Uh, the same way, if, if you get along with somebody's wife, but you don't get along with their husband, that relationship's not going to last very long because it's a package deal. They go together, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. You can't say, I love Jesus, and you say, but I don't want anything to do with his people. It's a package deal. If you say, I love Jesus, you're going to have to find a way to get along with his bride, the church. Okay? And, and, and maybe you could think of it this way. Um, my oldest memory from when I was a young child, the, the oldest memory I have is my being with my yellow blankie. Did anyone have a blankie like that? All right, I had a yellow blankie. And it, was, it had a yellow satin edge on it, and it had a soft middle, and I loved it. It was silky, it was soft, and it was smelly, right? <laughs> it was smelly because I carried it everywhere I went. And you couldn't say, I want to hang out with toddler Ben, but I don't want anything to do with this blankie. No, we were a package deal. If you wanted to hang out with me, you would have to put up with my smelly blankie. And that's how it is with Jesus, you want to hang out with Jesus, you're going to have to put up with this church. Now, may, maybe some of you are saying, but pastor, you don't know what happened to me. I was sexually abused in the church, pastor, and nobody did anything about it. I can't go back to that church. I can't go back to church. Or, or maybe you said, I've seen so much division and anger and fighting in the church. I can't go back to church. Or, or maybe you think, um, you know, I, I, church doesn't make any sense to me. It's boring. I can't, I can't go back to church. Well, Jesus explains this. He, he talks about that as he, he says, and, and so remember where he was. He's in Caesarea Philippi on a rock. And right next to him is this spring that they called the gateway to hell, the highway to hell. And he, he, he says, the gate of hell is right next to the rock of the church. Maybe you've heard that before. That when God builds a church, the devil builds one right next to it. Have you ever heard that? I could say it's even, even closer than that. You know what the, the, the devil is usually called in the Bible? He's described as a snake. Because snakes can slither their way into places that they don't belong. I remember when we moved down to Florida, uh, I was a really bad husband because I left my wife to unpack the, bo the ba boxes uh, with her parents and I went off to a youth retreat right away, like in the first week of being there in Florida. Um, I'm still paying for that one. And, and I was, that was because guess what happened? When I left, she went to the back porch and guess what's in the porch? A big black snake inside of our house. And my wife hates snakes right? And, and somehow that snake found a way to slither into our home where it didn't belong. And that's what happens in the church. The snake, the devil, slithers in where he doesn't belong, and some, some bad things happen. Abuse happens, and division happens, and dissension happens. But that's not God. That's the snake. And remember, the church is the people. And sometimes the snake is living in us, and we're the problem. And we're causing the problem, and we're causing the division, and we're causing the issues. And then we need to repent. And so, um, maybe you have to step away from the church for a while if you were abused or this, something happened to you and you have to walk away. And, and I, maybe I could tell you, the young people, especially something that was told to me, 
Now, you will remember everything that you learned in confirmation. I only remember this one thing, but you guys will remember it all. I remember this thing from my pastor. I had a staunch Lutheran pastor. I mean, he was a black robe wearing, Lutheran confession reading, staunch Lutheran pastor, and he was a straight shooter. But it surprised me one time when he said to us, he said, "Um, you know what, guys? If you walk away, when you're looking from a church, just go to a church that loves Jesus and loves his word. And I couldn't believe that he didn't say it. He didn't say, you have to be in this church or you have to do this thing. He said, go to the church that loves Jesus and loves his word. And that's what I'd say to you too. And I'm saying that because guess what? If I go downstairs and look at all those pictures of all those kids in, the, in their white robes, a lot of them have walked away from the church and have not come back. And so, don't be that person. Don't be that person who says, I don't want anything to do with the church anymore, so I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to walk away and I'll never come back. Because you need to be with Jesus and his church. So find a church that loves Jesus and loves his word and also loves his people, loves the community, right? Now, I pray that we would always be that church, that we would be the church that loves Jesus and loves his word and loves his community. But we talked about this um, in, that God's going to win in the end. The church is always going to remain. The, the gate of hell will never overcome the church. But we talked about this last week when I taught on the church. We talked about Revelation chapters 2 and 3. At the end of the Bible, uh, Jesus talks with John, who's in prison. The apostle John is in prison in Patmos. And he tells John to write seven letters to seven churches. And it's kind of a progress report for these churches in Revelation. And he says, write to the angel or the messenger, probably the pastor. He says, John, write this letter to the pastors of these churches. And this is a pretty direct talk. It's a pretty direct progress report. If you were at that seminar yesterday, it's very direct, like yesterday, um, where, where Jesus says, here's some good things that are going on in the church. Ephesus, you got these things that are good that are going on, but you have a couple of these things that aren't good. You, you've lost your first love. You don't care about people anymore. You don't care about the word anymore. And then goes to the next church. You got some good things going on there, but here's some, good, uh, some bad things that you got to fix. And it goes one church to the other. And I told the young people, I said, that's kind of what the church is like. It's a mixed bag. If you look at good views, you say, well, these are the good things that are going on, and these are some of the things that need to be worked on. You go to St. Matthew's. These are some of the good things that are going on. These are some of the things that need to get worked on. You go to St. Mary's. These are some of the good things that are going on. These are some of the things that need to get worked on. You go to Pleasant Valley. These are some good things that are going on. These are some things that need to get worked on. You go to Radiant. There's some good things going on. These are the things that need to be worked on. Every church is a mixed bag. And that's what, that's what Jesus says about the churches. But he doesn't say it should stay that way. He tells every single one of those churches, repent and change and deal with those problems or I'll remove your lampstand. It means I'll take away my presence. And we heard yesterday that literally probably hundreds of churches of all different denominations are going to be closed in the next 40 years unless we change and go back to Jesus and focus on his word and love Jesus, love his word, and love the community. And so I pray that we continue to be that kind of church. So if all this stuff is going on in the church, why keep going to church, right? If it's messy, if it's hard, it, if, if all this stuff's going, why show up? Why not just, you know, get it delivered like Starbucks to your home, right? Well, because Jesus says this, he ends by saying, because I'm going to give the church the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I remember that day when my dad took the keys and he tossed them to me and I had the keys to the car. Freedom, right? Freedom and control. And that's what God is saying here. He's given the keys to the kingdom of heaven and he tosses them to the church. He tosses them to you guys. You're the church. And Jesus says, what that means is, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? Well, binding means whatever you shut out out of heaven, whatever you don't allow into heaven, will not be allowed into heaven. Whatever you close the door on will not be be forgiven. Whatever you open up, whenever you open that door, that'll, that'll be open to heaven. Okay? So how does that work? Well, I think this is clearest in the Lord's Supper. Clearest in the Lord's Supper. You guys have um, taken classes and we want people to take membership classes before they take the Lord's Supper. They learn about what the Lord's Supper is. And then if somebody is continuing to walk away from God, don't want to repent, don't want to change, they're not allowed at the Lord's Supper. You know, if somebody is, is beating their wife, 
and they say, but we want to take, the, I, I'm still a Christian, I'm a good Christian man. You know, she do, they, don't, they don't get to take the Lord's Supper. They're living unrepentant sin. They don't get to come and get forgiveness as you're, you need to repent and change. If you're being divisive and a problem and, and hurting people and, and a problem in the church, you don't get to take the Lord's Supper. You need to repent and change. That's binding and that's helpful and that's good and that's loving. You know, just like at your table at home, you, you don't allow certain behavior at your table. And that's what Jesus is saying. But anybody who repents, anybody who asks forgiveness, uh, Jesus ate with the prostitutes and the sinners and the tax collectors and the thieves and the robbers and the murderers. Anyone who said, I've sinned against Jesus, he said, come to the table. Come to the table. My table is wide open. There's a seat for you. Come over here. Uh, fill up your plate. Come sit with me and eat with me. Uh, anyone who repents of sin, no matter how far you fall, and that's why lots of times Jesus would eat with the prostitute before he'd eat with the religious person who didn't think they need to be forgiven. And that's what's so great about the Lord's Supper. Now, I, I, you know, I, it was said yesterday, but I promise you I said this first. You know, the church, you can hear a better sermon online. And, and, and you, can, um, you can hear better music online. But why do we come to church? Next week, you get to come to the table. Come to the table. You get to come and sit at God's table and, and have this meal together, the Lord's Supper, where you receive his forgiveness of sins and we're in communion. We're a family. We're, we're a family that remembers what Jesus did for us on the cross and we know we're forgiven and loved and accepted, not because we figured it out, but because we repented of our sin and we trust in Jesus and we sit at the table together. And it makes me think about our own table at home. You know, our lives are just as crazy as yours. Our kids are going in every different direction. We got sports in every direction and we got kids on technology and I'm reading a book and Emily's doing this thing. But every day at 5.30, we shut everything off and we sit at the table. Every day we sit at the table at 5.30, we shut everything off because we're a family and we love each other and we pray together. And that's what we do. We all have our busy lives, we got everything going on, but once a week we shut everything off and we come to the table. We come to church as a family and we know that God is our Father because of Jesus' work and we eat this meal together and we love one another and you don't, ha you don't get to have that uh, hand delivered. You can't deliver that kind of love and that kind of connection to your home. That doesn't come delivered. You have to gather together and, and experience that. And so it doesn't work to say, I want the product, Jesus, but I don't want to deal with the people because Jesus has decided to work through the people. He said, uh, John says this, no one has ever seen God. You can't just go right to God. No one has ever seen God but if we love one another, we gather together, if we love one another, God lives in us and is made complete in us. All right, you understand what that means? We can't go directly to God and we can't see God, but when we love each other as a church and gather around the table together, God's there and that's how we see God. God is made real as he lives in us as we love one another as God first loved us. So, it doesn't work to be a Jesus-only Christian and not care about his bride. They're a package deal. They go together. If you say, I believe in Jesus, you also say, I believe in the church. As messy it is, as much work it is, maybe you need to step away for a little bit, but you're not going to live your whole life away from the church. It's going to destroy your relationship with Jesus. So, if you believe in Jesus, you'll believe in the church. If you love Jesus, you will love your church. It's a package deal. Amen. Please stand.